Greetings, and bienvenue, mine crew. Thank you for returning to this broadcast. And welcome to new viewers joining us for the first time. If you like a video, then feel free to subscribe. All right, here's my story. If any of you have an explanation for it that's plausible, I'm all ears. For reference I live in Montana. A few strange things have happened out here while I was growing up. For starters, the first incident must have been when I was six or so, maybe seven. I live on a property with a few trees, about seven acres, but outside of the trees around the house. The area is just nothing but sagebrush and dry grass. Property is overlooking a deep gully that goes on to a neighbor's property. Anyways back to the seven-year-old me. Playing some sort of game pretending to be in the army with the neighbor's kid next door. All of a sudden we hear this screaming coming from down in the gully. Unlike anything I've ever heard, even to this day. Doesn't sound like the coyotes that live in the gully, doesn't sound like a bobcat, doesn't sound human. Immediately book it out of my field and into my house as fast as our legs could carry us. Still don't know what it was. The rest of these experiences are different in nature, but it was that first one that really made me realize that there's scary shit out there in the woods. Be me. Now about 14, hanging out with some friends, planning to camp out in my friend's field and stargaze because shit, space is pretty neat. Head out to the field, there were probably about six of us. The field is bordered by a line of maybe 12 large pine trees that are next to an irrigation ditch. As we're all walking out there, maybe 10 at night, a friend in the lead stops in his tracks. We all look ahead to see what the holdup is. Pine trees are about 500 yards from us. The pine trees are illuminated at night by five or six floating orbs. I don't have a good way of describing these. They emitted this sort of humming noise, quiet enough that you wouldn't hear it if you weren't paying attention. Orbs changed color blinking in blue, white, red and green, with no sort of discernible pattern. At first we thought someone was just doing something weird with bright lights out in the woods. Orbs start moving from their previously stationary positions. We all freak the fuck out. Two from our group of six pussy out and run back to the house. Rest of us stay there, watching these things just continue to dance for almost an hour. Gradually the orbs just wink out in the night, slowly just blinking off one by one until one orb remains. It emits a blue light, still keeps humming. We try to get closer to the thing, just to get a better look. We make it about 100 yards before the orb stops humming. I feel a sudden sense of dread, like something was out of place. Everything is dead silent, the only sound is that of our breathing. One of my friends breaks the deafening silence, shouts, hey. In his loudest voice, the orb, as if sensing we were there, makes a horrendous high-pitched whine. I can only imagine this is what dog whistles sound like to dogs. All of us cover our ears with our hands trying our best to block out the noise. The orb moves suddenly directly upward. The best way I can describe this is when a piece of metal gets picked up by a large magnet, just suddenly moving directly up in a rapid fashion. After moving about 200 feet into the air, the orb just blinks out like the lights before it, with it the noise suddenly stops. We all nope the fuck out of there quick, all of us wishing we did so earlier. It's been eight years since then, no idea what happened. I still have one last part to this if there's any interest. Growing up in rural Montana, you learn that life is one piss poor adventure after another. You learn about shit like the miracle of life and how the world can take this gift away on a whim. I am not an easily disgusted man. I've had to deal with death and dead animals since I was about eight, it's just a natural part of things. Be me, now 17. Work moving pipe, feeding cattle, and doing odd jobs for a neighbor. My boss, Fred, is a man in his 70s, Korean war vet, and is a man of few words. Needless to say he's seen some shit but he's the type who's looked death in the eye, spit at it, and told it to fuck off. 
One summer evening I'm working at Fred's moving some pipe. I'm designated to move pipe for a field that's maybe 600 yards long, mostly just grass with some old cottonwood trees dense with growth leading into a messy thicket of trees, shrubs, and bushes. Lining the back of the field is an old rotting fence. Sometimes Fred has some of his cows graze out in this field, usually congregating out by the trees. Things going all right, I'm making my usual rounds, there's no cows out tonight, making moving the pipe a little easier. As I'm finishing up the moving pipe I see some lights in the trees. These lights don't look like the ones I saw several years back, they look more like just flashlight beams. I don't make the connection to the humming lights and I brush it off as some teenagers getting drunk in the woods because Fred said he'd had some problems with them in the past. I go back to Fred's tell him what I saw. Fred says we'll check it out in the morning, and says he might have me build an electric fence to keep teens from sneaking into his woods. I head home, sleep easy. Head to Fred's in the morning, we walk out to the field to see if there's any trash left from drunk teens. Walking along to the tree line a particular stench arises, one that smells of death and decay I feel a little uneasy to my stomach but continue on. Fred comments, sure smells of something ripe. The smell gets stronger as we get closer. We make it about 50 feet from the trees before we're confronted with a sight I can only describe as ghastly. Three of Fred's cows have been killed and arranged in a triangular pattern. I finally give in to my stomach and vomit. Fred gives me a moment to collect myself before he remarks, now what kind of sick fuck would do a thing like this? Fred's cows smell like they've been rotting here for weeks in the summer heat but their bodies indicate otherwise. The first cow has been cleaned to the bone, dry. This poor cow looks like scavengers finished scavenging it months ago. The second and third cows are in much less of a state of decay than the first. Second cow is completely normal, apart from one grisly detail. Cow 2's eyes have been removed from their sockets, nowhere to be found around the body. The third cow was possibly the most interesting, and also the most grotesque. Cow looked completely normal, eyes still intact, all limbs still present. Fred motions me to help him turn over the cow to inspect its underside. Up until this cow's death it was perfectly healthy. A cow that Fred took pride in, weighing in at nearly 900 pounds. The cow's body is pushed over with relative ease, seemingly weighing a small fraction of its previous mass. We couldn't find any sort of incision marks or form of injury on the cow anywhere. Neither of us a fucking clue as to what could have done this. Fred pays me $200 cash to keep my mouth shut about the whole situation, never speak of it again with Fred. 11. Waiting for the bus. My house was out in the country so my bus stop is way far from my house. All around are woods, only one road in and out, this is in rural Montana so that should give you an idea of how remote my house was, the bus even had to make a special route for me. One morning I'm out there earlier than usual because my parents are fighting again and I don't want to deal with that shit. Early November so it's cold but not freezing. Tourist season is over so I'm not really looking around for anyone else. Figure I'm alone so I put my headphones in and jam out to some sweet tunes while I wait doing a sick air guitar riff when I notice there's a guy across the street watching me. Oh shit how long has he been watching me dot x. Try to pretend I'm just scratching an itch or something cause holy fuck that's really embarrassing. Guy doesn't seem to care, he just keeps staring at me. Stereotypical hiker, has the backpack and boots and everything. Think to myself that it's pretty late in the season for hikers. Start getting a little irritated that the guy is just standing there like I'm some tourist attraction. Turn my back on him and make my music louder. Still feel his eyes on me, eventually turn back around. He's still there, in the same place. I start getting super creeped out. What's this weirdest deal? Bus should be here any time now, kinda hoping it gets here quick. The guy slowly reaches into his pocket and slowly pulls out a disposable camera. 
puts it up to his face. His finger slowly presses the button and he takes a picture of me. I have no fucking idea what to do. But he's not done yet. He slowly turns the camera around and takes a picture of his face. I'm thoroughly shitting bricks now. Absolutely certain I'm about to be serial killed. Then just like that the bus comes. Run up to it and throw myself inside as soon as the doors open. Bus driver is looking at me like I'm an idiot. Tell her there's some weird guy standing around taking pictures of me. Where? She says. Realize the guy is gone. He must have taken off when the bus came. Later that day, the bus dropped me off at the same spot. Make sure the guy isn't there when I get off, he's gone. The bus leaves and I decide to go look around the area where he was. There's something by the road. Pick it up. It's a fucking disposable camera. Pocket it and get the pictures developed as soon as I save up enough allowance to do it by myself. Didn't tell my parents because I didn't want them to start driving me to school, stupid I know. Sneak off one day when my parents are shopping and tell the photo developer guy in the photo department, yeah I'm old, that I found the camera and don't know what's on it, he says he'll take a look. Next time I can sneak off during shopping I go to pick up the pictures. Guy gives me a refund. What.jpg says there were only two pictures on the camera. He's looking at me weird. Gives me the two photos. One is very clearly of me, staring at the camera with a worried expression. Looks like it was taken from across the street. Oh shit, I already know what the second photo is. Heart is pounding as I take it out of the envelope. He's staring right into the camera. I remember him not moving but there's some kind of weird effect going on with his eyes, motion blur or something. Makes it look like his eyes are entirely made of the colored part, with a weird shaped pupil. Scares the absolute shit out of me. Throw both pictures away and nope the fuck back to my parents. Pick kinda related, closest I could come to what his eyes looked like. Here's a story I remember my great-grandma told me about something her brother experienced. A little backstory. We're a Native American family living on a reservation in Montana, in a town that has a lot of stories related to something paranormal or unexplained. This story takes place in the late 1940s. Her brother was out looking for some cows that had run off the night before. He'd been out for quite a while and saw nothing so General decided to let his horse rest and have a smoke. He was stopped by the Sundance Lodge and as he was rolling his cigarette he heard movement near the lodge, so he decided to go look. When he got close he looked up at the center pole and there was a buffalo skull tied to it. He said that its eyes were glowing red and a long tongue was wagging around out of it. This scared the hell out of him and he got on his horse and rode back to the house. He told his dad and he said that they should not go to the Sundance anymore because the people who put it on weren't doing it right and it was causing bad spirits to come onto lands. Be me. 17. Visiting some family in the middle of nowhere Montana. Literally no other house around for a good 10-12 miles. Relatives own a metric fuckton of land. Lots of pasture, forest, and some mountains. Relatives have two kids around my age. They're the cowboy type so we don't get along too well at first. We eventually warm up to one another and become fast friends, and many times we'll end up telling each other stories. One night we're all outside after having a cookout and sitting around a fire with some beers their parents gave them and doing the usual story swap. The bro tells me one about how there's a trail you can see ghostly figures walking on during a full moon, says they're Native American ghosts from way back when. My interest is piqued. Ask if they'll show me the trail the next day. He turns me down because their parents told them to stay away from it. This does not deter me, so I go to a higher authority aka their parents. Their dad gets a little pissed that they told me the story, then finally relents because, you'll just go looking for it and get yourself lost. 
brush off the insult because he's probably right, then head to bed so I'm rested for the next day. Literally crack of dawn their dad knocks on my door and tells me to get ready, so I do so. 30 minutes later we're on horseback and heading for the trail. He's pointing out things and giving me advice. I don't remember any of it except for the part about the stones that were stacked on top of each other. Clearly tells me not to fuck with them. Says they're cairns the Indians used for burial. Promise not to touch them. Fully intend on touching them anyway because I'm too fucking curious. Hour or so of riding we end up in the forest and near the base of the mountains. He dismounts and tells me to follow. Leads me in a good 30 to 40 yards and points to the ground. And sure enough there's a trail, though faint and somewhat overgrown in some places. We walk it for a while. I find a few arrowheads or what look like them. He tells me to put them back because they ain't ours and they don't take kindly to thieves. Okay, whatever, put them back minus one I slip into a pocket when he isn't looking. Walk back to the horses and head back to the house, meanwhile I'm formulating a plan. Fast forward to the last week I'm there, their dad has to leave for a few days to go do some work. It's my chance, wait till everyone else is asleep slip out of the house and towards the barn. Oh hey look, there's a full moon and not a cloud in the sky, jackpot. Saddle the horse I've been using. Grab a spare lantern and flashlight from the storage room, then head out towards the trail. About 45 minutes out, looking toward the trail and holy shit they weren't kidding. You can see ghostly figures either walking or on horseback just meandering along the path. Decide they can wait since it seems like they aren't really going anywhere, and set about looking for the nearest cairn. Hit the jackpot again. Spot one not too far from where I'm sitting on my majestic steed, so I head over to it and dismount. Literally just looks like a fuck ton of small rocks stacked atop one another. Curiosity intensifies. Light the lantern, grab the flashlight, and set about moving the stones to see if there's anything under them. About five stones into the project, the horse whinnies a little and I catch the sound of voices on the wind. Cast the light from the flashlight around to see if anyone is around, don't see anything. Uh, all right then, go back to work. More stones I remove, the more the horse seems to get nervous. Bout halfway through, horse says fuck this noise and bolts back home after rearing like the fear of God just hit it. Am pissed that now I'll have to walk back, but soldier on in my task nonetheless. Starts getting cold out, don't really pay it any mind until I start seeing my breath. I figure that I'm near the mountains so this might be normal, still get a little weirded out. Eventually I get to the bottom, it's just lined with more rocks. WTF, that's it. Get pissed, and reach to start moving the floor. That's when shit hit the fan. The wind picks up hard, blows out the lantern and knocks it over. I look over at it in time to see a white figure slide out of my peripheral, turn to try and catch a look. Suddenly it's like a thousand natives start up a war cry in my head. Vision goes blurry, and I pass out. Wake up. It's daylight, and I'm laying in a hospital bed with my relatives sitting around me. First thing I really notice is the dad is back and he looks pissed. They let the doctor know I'm awake, he comes in, asks me questions, then leaves. The dad walks in right after the doc exits, grabs me by the shoulders, and starts shaking. Starts saying shit like, I fucking told you not to mess with them anon. Now look what the fuck you done. Says once I'm better I'm leaving and never allowed back. At this point I don't care. I just want him to shut up. He finally leaves. The son comes in and gives me the story. 
The horse had ran up to the house making all kinds of noises and woke everyone up. They saw I wasn't in bed. He put two and two together, and he set out towards the trail. Said he found me bleeding from my ears next to the cairn, which was intact. Was worried I'd been thrown from my horse, so he radioed his mom to let her know. She in turn called the dad, and he rushed home. A week later I'm on a bus back home with a hell of a concussion still and ears that ring on a near constant basis. Fast forward five years, I'm talking to the dad about something. We were still friendly, I just couldn't go back there. I ask him how he knew I'd fucked with the cairn if it was still in one piece. He tells me that I'm not the only one that lets curiosity get the better of them and leaves it at that. Backstory Started a new job in an old building with a cool co-worker. Stoner dude who's really into paranormal shit tells me the building is haunted. I ask how he knows. Proceeds to tell me he's very sensitive to spirits and shit cause he was possessed in high school. Gonna retell the story from his perspective. Be me 17, high school choir boy. On a group trip to Montana, I can't remember where. Whole class is staying a night at shitty, meet and fuck, style motel, for a night. Guys are separated from girls I'm with two guys I know and one other dude. Instantly we all notice the same thing, child-sized ash handprint on the ceiling. Notice spot under print is ball sweating hot while everywhere else is cold as f. Close bud wants to mess around pulls out no shit Ouija board. Everyone but me chickens out. Put hands on board skeptical as fuck and mocking the whole thing. If there are any spirits in this room, make yourself known. Five minutes of dead silence. If there are any spirits in this room, make your presence known. Same deal, no reply. Take both hands off board. Bad idea. JPG. Instantly feel strange, hot and sweaty with a raging headache. Put hands back on board and start to feel better. Figure it's just nerves. We'll never know why I did this but I look up from the board and say, if there are any energies in this room I give you permission to use my body as a vessel. A wave of heat hits me hard. Blackout. Wake up and see the clock. I was out for 45 minutes. WTF. Two guys are on the bed watching TV obviously avoiding eye contact and nervous as shit. Close bud is across from me crying really hard. In the 10 years I've known this kid I've never seen him cry once. Anon what happened are you okay? Proceeds to tell me during my blackout I screamed and shook for a while. I also eventually said to him in a low raspy voice that it was his fault that his friend drowned. He's never told anyone that story. Don't talk about this for a while, things are okay for about two months. Been two months since the motel incident. Everything's been calm and I have barely thought about it. Living in a nice two-floor house with parents Mormon as fuck and my brother. Playing Halo and getting stoned with my brother one day. Start to get that really warm feeling again. Look over to bro standing over him is a creepy seven foot tall old man. Motherfucker has sunken eyes, pale skin, and about three teeth smiling like the fucking joker at me. He's wearing a pair of dark jeans, black work boots, a tucked in dark blue dress shirt and a black men in black style fedora. WTF WTF WTF. Jump back in my chair a bit but too awestruck for noise. Bro says, Anon what the fuck, not even noticing. Dude you see him right? Anon don't even fuck with me right now, I'm not stupid. Old man vanishes out of thin fucking air. Pretty freaked out but chalk it up to too much weed and not enough sleep try to forget incident. After this happens creepy shit starts going on in the house constantly.
Doors closing by themselves, noises only I can hear late at night, lamps and lights turning back on after I've turned them off shit like that. But what really freaks me out is that it feels like I'm seeing the old man everywhere. I would be walking around in public after school just hanging out and I see him out of the corner of my eye. I would only ever see him in the same two outfits either the first one I described or a long black creepy trench coat. This goes on for a while progressively getting more and more frequent. Don't tell parents because they're Mormon and would freak the fuck out that I was ever playing around with demonology and shit. One night I get up to go to the bathroom and see a red light coming from under my brother's door. I hear him talking to someone for a little while before I hear a low guttural voice respond. The voice is speaking in Latin I take notes of it on my phone. Only thing I hear bro say is, I'm not doing that he's my brother. Pretty freaked out go back to my room don't sleep. Look up Latin words, in the morning demon said, bring death upon him. Brother says, he slept all night. Losing it. Jif. Finally after a few weeks of this going on my parents are out of town leaving me and my brother home alone for a week. Shit starts to get really bad. Decide to tell my brother about it. Is super understanding and gets why I've been acting weird. Decide to do something about it, do a little bit more research into demonology. Look up the description of the old man that's been following me. The closest thing I could find was a demon whose name I can't remember. This thing is supposed to be super powerful and evil as fuck. To cut it short me and my brother ended up getting into contact with a Catholic priest who blessed my house in the traditional way. Figured it was the wise way to go. Catholics have the best methods on getting rid of demons. The entire time we do this I can feel the presence of the angry temperature rising and I'm feeling terrible. Complete the blessing and everything quiets down. Suddenly my back is burning and stinging. Bro lifts my shirt. There's three huge distinct bloody cuts down my back. After the priest leaves everything goes back to normal. Parents return and I never tell them about any of this. Finally over. PNG. This guy telling me the story was a little nervous the whole time I guess after all this he became super sensitive to spirits and is super into paranormal shit now. Anyway, that's it, I hope you liked it. Be me visiting Montana. Go to a turnoff for a wooded area that locals know is good for fishing and woods fuckery. In a woods with cousin his friend Bill, Bill's girl Shelby and Bill's younger brother Noah. They have cabins and cousins 19 so we all chill there for fishing and such. October so it's pretty cold he get the fireplace going and tell stories. Right before bed we hear something slam on the door of the cabin. Go out to see what hit it and it's a dead squirrel with no head. Figure wild animals so we lock everything up and zip up all our food so no bears smell anything. Middle of the night another slam. Only me and my older cousin are up. Slowly check out what it is and it's a dead possum this time cut in half. Spooked by now so he gets a 30 06 hunting rifle and stays up while I go to bed. Hear a shrill scream from the woods in human. Turn to cousin but he says it's a rabbit's death scream and to just go to bed. Wake up early, still freaked out. We open the door to go outside and two dead rabbits were torn up and a fox with a deer antler shoved in its abdomen. Decide this is our last day out here and cousin checks tracks but it just seems to be live circular hooves prints. Cousin's friend Bill let's call him is more curious than scared. Has a .22 Ruger pistol he brought to Plink and decides to go scope around with Noah. I fish some with Cousin and Shelby but we decide we're just going to pack shit up and get ready to go so we don't have to walk the path to the jeep at night. Get back and Bill's still gone but Thomas is back. Says Bill ran off after he saw some horn thing and sent him back to camp. Cousin and Shelby go off to find Bill because we have three hours of day left and me and Noah chill in the cabin. They come back with Bill like an hour later and he looks dazed or like in a trance. 
only wearing his vest missing his shirt, no gun to be found or his backpack. We found him walking near the river like this missing all his stuff. It's getting dark now and the forest is dead silent. Bill keeps saying, my pack, and pointing to the woods, but we all keep telling him there's no way to go find it in the dark. My pack, let's go. No way Bill why'd you leave it in the first place. Blank stare. Shelby cuddles up to him and we all grub on some food. Go to bed, no thumps that night on the door. Wake up early to get everyone up. Cousin says he's leaving and Bill's still on that, my pack, shit. Well I'm going to finish packing, don't be too long. Me and Noah head out with them to go look for the pistol and his pack, I wanted to shoot it before we went back home. We get to where they found Bill and he sorta just looks at me and Noah for a while. Uh, Bill where'd you leave it last? Blank stare. He sorta just gestures further at the woods off trail. Ah uh, you boys go back I guess I'll help him find it. Shelby says annoyed. Me and Thomas start heading back when we see my cousin on the trail. He shouts to Bill. I got our stuff all packed up we're going to head back. I'll take Noah back home if you want. Bill sorta just holds his hand up with a cracked smile. Didn't wave, just held his hand weird. Shelby shouts back that they'll search for like another hour, then take their car back. Get home and play some games, and chill. Bill doesn't answer, and neither does Shelby. Cousin starts getting worried now that it's dark again and heads back alone. After a while he comes back with no Bill or Shelby. Says their car's still there and the cabin's empty. After another day of no reply from Bill Game Wardens, are contacted and begin a search. A week goes by no Shelby, no Bill. They find Bill's shirt he left the first day torn along with his backpack with all its stuff spilt all over an area a half mile from the path. Nothing of Shelby's is found. I went back home to Colorado, but from what I've heard from talking with my cousin a while after they found Shelby's hat a week later with a little blood in it sitting on a tree stump next to a dead possum. Bill and Shelby are assumed to be dead after the search went cold and the Montana mountains get pretty harsh in the fall months. On July 18, 2007, Barbara Bollock, a 55-year-old woman from Corvallis, Montana, went on a hiking trip in the Bitterroot Mountains with Jim Rawmaker, a friend who was visiting from California. They were heading toward Bear Creek Overlook when Jim stopped to look at a scenic view. Barbara had been about 6 to 9 meters, 20 to 30 feet, behind him at the time, but Jim claimed that after turning away from her for less than a minute, he looked back to see that she had completely vanished. After authorities were notified, an extensive search of the area turned up no trace of Barbara. On the surface, Jim Rawmaker's story sounds pretty unbelievable. However, he was reportedly very cooperative with the authorities and since there is no evidence that he did anything to Barbara, they do not consider him a suspect in her disappearance. It seemed likely that a guilty person would attempt to dream up a much better story than his victim simply vanishing into thin air. It's been nearly six years, but authorities haven't found any trace of foul play or any hint of what may have happened to Barbara Bollock. I live in northern Montana near the Canadian border. Lots of the strange happenings deal with a horseman that the cops chased for hours and Native American magic and lore called Indian religion. One story that stayed with me was about a woman who was cheating on her husband. She would watch out the window for him and the signal to meet him was a lit cigarette in the distance. Eventually the husband got wise and went to a medicine man for advice. The advice given was to leave offerings of tobacco at each portal, doors and windows, he would send spirits there to monitor her fidelity. So he did and on the night of her and her lover's usual meeting, she saw no signal of him outside. She stayed up late into the night waiting. At last a few hours later, she saw a red spark outside her window. 
Rushing to look she opened the lace curtains to reveal an impossibly old woman, who grabbed her face and twisted it into a horrible visage. The identity of her lover was never known and her infidelity showed on her face for the rest of her days. Now I know I'm not no Stephen King, but that's how I heard it. Be me. Work in a gas station in South Montana. Night shift, Wednesday. Literally two customers all night. Bored out of my mind. This guy turns up out of nowhere. No cars at the pump, no cars in the car park. This guy is about five foot, has a huge beard and stinks of finish. Asks me if I want to buy some of his spare dishwasher. I say no. He thanks me and leaves. Comes back in two hours. So my friend, are you sure about that dishwasher? I say no, I don't even question where the fuck the dishwasher is and why the fuck he's trying to sell me one. Okay that's fine, so does your gas taste nice, if so I'll take some. At this point I'm freaked out, I don't know how to deal with people like this. Tell his the gas has run out. Okay, I'll just take some gum then. Give him the gum and tell him I'm closing. He sprints out the main doors, across the road and into the woods screaming. I had five hours left on my shift too, I spent the whole time afraid he'd come back. I rang my boss and he just asked if he had a gun, which he didn't from what I could see, and he just laughed and said hey it's the night shift what do you expect? I have a memory that haunts me and I have decided I need to share it. Maybe it was just a series of dreams that I couldn't let go of or maybe it really was a memory of something magical. I will share it here first. I haven't posted on 4 chains in a very long time but, X, has always been my home. When I was a little boy like 5 years old. We lived in the countryside in Montana surrounded by tall grass not far from the mountains. One day my brother came to me and told me he had a friend who wanted to meet me. We walked to the edge of the yard and in the grass a person was sitting well hidden. He said her name was Rosie but I called her the grass lady. My brother made me swear I wouldn't tell anyone about her and I did keep it a secret. I told my dad about this recently and said I wasn't sure about this memory but he confirmed we did live next to pastures of tall grass back then and he thinks I'm remembering something that really happened. So all these years later I have broken my vow of secrecy and told my parents about Rosie. I haven't talked to my brother about it because he doesn't seem to remember anything about our childhood. We both had traumatic childhoods basically. Rosie was old, I could tell that much. She didn't speak, instead she just looked at me and I could feel her thoughts and feelings. She seemed to be very worn down with most of her teeth ground down or missing. Sometimes she would give me little things she made like bracelets made of grass. I was always very polite and thankful to her. I spent a lot of time with her but I think my brother was bored of her because he would usually leave and go play somewhere else. I was too little to understand much about the grass lady except that she was old and didn't speak and lived in the grass. I wasn't old enough to understand how different she really was. At that point I just assumed she was another kind of person I hadn't met and the world just had some people who didn't wear clothes and were telepathic and whose skin was jet black and covered in hair. I just assumed grass people were another kind of people everyone knew about but for some reason my brother convinced me not to talk about them. I got the feeling from her she only trusted children anyway. I'm getting shivers as I write this. I don't know how to get across how secret and special these memories are to me but I have many such stories from my life. Rosie was really special to me though. She loved me and I loved her back even though I was actually scared of her as well. My brother told me she wanted to steal us, kidnap, and we had to stop talking to her but I refused. One day my parents were fighting and I was crying outside hiding from it when I decided to go looking for Rosie. I don't have very clear memories beyond her face and eyes and the bracelets she gave me but I'm fairly certain that day was the first time I let her hold me. By then I was no longer afraid of her. I still get emotional even now thinking about it.
I don't know how long these meetings lasted but I do remember seeing the trails through the tall grass she was using to get to the edge of our yard and when she wasn't around I would go walking through them but only so far until I was afraid of getting lost back there. I didn't want to disappear from my family. One day after many attempts to find the grass lady or hoping another grass person would arrive and I could make another friend I asked my brother where Rosie went and he said we can't see her anymore. I don't remember if he said she died or left or what I just remember crying about it and for the first time feeling what it was like to lose a friend. That's my story. Thank you for reading it. It still makes me emotional because I do miss her to this day and I can't really share these memories with anyone. Like so many stories in my life it's just too crazy, but this one especially makes me feel like I'm 5 years old again just reliving it. I seriously had no idea that things like grass people or sasquatch was weird. I just thought I had a nice old lady outside at the edge of my yard who loved me. When you get older and look back at these things, all I can say is life is amazing. For all the horror stories I have from my life I am grateful at least one of these paranormal things I experienced makes my heart swell. Thank you for not kidnapping me Rosie. Thank you for the bracelets and holding me when I was sad that day. And thank you Anons for reading this. You can share it or keep it with you in your hearts too. I promise this world is magical. One detail that sticks with me was her eyes. They weren't human. Super vibrant brown eyes almost glowing but all black with no whites of the eye. This along with her jet black skin. I still thought she was just another person but clearly a different kind of person than I had met before. I don't remember her ever standing up but she had very long arms. She wasn't massive but for a female I know it was bizarre to me that she was still bigger than any adult I knew. I assumed and felt she was old. But for all I know she could have been young like a person in their 20s which would explain why she was doing something as taboo as spending time with humans. She had longish hair around the top of her head like any other woman but the rest of her body was covered in shorter hair like bare fur. Her breasts were almost bare which was why I got the initial realization that she was naked and not wearing clothes. I remember her letting me touch the palms of her hands which were all black like the rest of her. Facial details are harder to remember because her eyes stole all of my attention. Her eyes will always be the thing I remember most because it's what I spent the most time looking at. Whenever she told me things with her eyes and I got it, she would get very excited and rock back and forth and laugh. I had no idea why she was so excited but now I understand, she was old enough to know how amazing it was for the two of us to be spending time and communicating. I think she was amazed that I was only a little afraid of her. I'm sure she was impressed with both me and my brother for not treating her like a monster. Regarding her voice, she never spoke or made loud sounds, she just made a kind of laughing noise like if you laugh while covering your mouth. She laughed like any person would if they were goofing off in a classroom trying not to get in trouble. Again it's only all these years later I understand what she was so giddy about. She was doing something incredible and taboo and totally getting away with it. Worked in Glacier National Park in Northwest Montana in 2011 as a housekeeper, dishwasher. Worked at the smallest and most remote location there, the Rising Sun. Had a tiny restaurant, two small motels with maybe 20 rooms each as well as a little over a dozen ancient cabins. Was a really laid-back place and being so small everyone who worked there knew each other, people from all over the world. Anyways I became good friends with a couple foreign guys while I was there and we would bring some others to get drunk near the edge of the location where the woods met the farthest cabins. One night in the middle of the summer we were all chilling and drinking in our usual spot pretty late at night when out of nowhere five or so guys came out of the woods. They were dressed in full commando gear like you would see in a movie, all black with combat helmets. They had black face masks and fully kitted M4s like some Navy SEAL looking guys. They came out of the woods with flashlights on their rifles sweeping the area. 
Upon seeing us they demanded we return to our cabins which we immediately did. We never were able to figure out what they were doing in the middle of one of the most isolated locations in an already desolate national park, much less why they had all that gear. I remember cleaning one of the main building's bathrooms next to the location's manager's office and hearing him screaming at someone on the phone. This was strange because he had always been very quiet and barely spoke. Listening in I heard him say, I don't know who the fuck you think you are scaring all my guests and employees with no warning. I demand to know what agency you're with and what this is about. I got out there after that and didn't hear anything else. A few days later we left the park to pick up bulk cigarettes and liquor and there were police checkpoints at the exit. There was one evening I wanna say about nine years back. Two friends and myself often went gopher hunting in northern Montana, hill country area. We'd bring .22s onto a guy's land that we knew in the hills near Havre. On this day we came after school about 5 p.m., little later than normal but whatever right. Well that's what we thought till long about 7 p.m. when we were starting to talk about heading back before we lost sunlight. We were about two miles away from the truck when we heard a fucking gut-wrenching screaming from the other side of a large hill to the right of us. None of us could tell what the hell it was except the res kid with us. He was a Blackfoot and he told us it was a skinwalker. I suggested that we take the direct way back and to leave our guns loaded. We hurried along this ditch-like path through the hills. It was a little longer a path but it would be easy to run through if we had to run. I packed a little snub nose .38 for cougars but tonight it was my skinwalker piece. As we walked back at a hurried pace I kept my eyes glued to the ridges of the path. An hour passed and just as I was about to calm down I see a human shaped head with a grayish color to it peeking over a ridge 50 feet from the path. I go to aim my revolver and point the flashlight at it and in that split second it disappears. I tell the guys to watch the sides of the path with the rifles. They were 22s but it's what we had. It was the last half mile so we ran occasionally hearing it screaming. We see it running through the trees near us in flashes but I think it only didn't attack us because we stuck together. They tend to target people by themselves. Tired and coughing we got into the truck. I saw it one more time 20 feet away as I was closing the door and I shot at it with my pistol. After that we never hunted in the evening again. Only day hunts. Camping on a ranch in Montana, nearly a full moon but not quite so it was very bright in the trees where we set up camp. We had found part of a cow skeleton near our camp that had been torn apart by scavengers and we were checking it out when we heard what sounded like a woman being murdered in the distance. Everyone knew it was a cougar screaming but it still makes you jump when you hear it because it sounds exactly like a human woman. Immediately after the cougar scream dies down the coyotes start howling. We realize we're surrounded by coyotes because the howls are coming from every direction, none of these animals are usually a threat to a camper but it was still rather spooky to hear all that right before bed. It probably doesn't sound too scary as a story but when you experience it in real life it unsettles you on a primal level to know there are large predators prowling around the place you're supposed to sleep and the only thing between you and them is a thin piece of nylon fabric. My grandfather told me stories of his childhood, he grew up on a farm in Montana. A particular story he told me was of his friend during his childhood. I was young when he had told me, about 10. He said there was an old man that lived out in a barn in the woods. He would come visit at night, but never left the woods. Each night for 40 days he would stand at the edge of the tree line. He never spoke but my grandpa would talk to him for hours until on the 41st day the old man was in his room. My grandpa woke up to a sound that resembled his mother yelling, he woke to the old man in the doorway. 
My grandpa turned on his lamp and the old man was gone. But a symbol was carved into the wall. He told me it looked like a triangle with a single line coming out of the top. He also told me that he never saw the old man again. He died last week and me and my brother were looking through his photos and boxes to see what we could use for a memoriam. I found a photo of the old man it looked like a person's face was removed, stretched and distorted on another body, it had no nose and gaping black eye holes with graying skin and dark teeth. He told me that the old man came from a place beyond the woods called the other world. The photo below is my recreation of the photo. I ended up losing it, but hope to find it very soon. Used to go visit Grandpa up outside of Bozeman in the winters. Grandpa is this tiny little, frail old man, but he's hardy as kick. He used to take us snowshoeing up in the mountains and carry most of the gear in this sled he pulled behind him. It was kicking cold up there, your snot would be frozen before it left your nose. The times he did convince us to go out, we ended up staying in ice caves that Grandpa had carved into snowbanks earlier in the winter. It got dark really early, and of course no campfires because ice and snow everywhere. One year we're out there camping with Grandpa, and he's really on edge the whole trip. Don't ask him why because we are stupid kids and don't think it matters. Random outbursts, yelling at us for not tying a knot right. Yelling at us for not keeping up with his insane pace. Stops hiking at about 2 p.m. nightfall isn't for another three and a half hours. Me and brother exchange WTF, looks with each other. Look around for his ice cave there isn't one. Hey grandpa where are we camping? Grandpa is nowhere to be found. Can't find his footprints, which is strange because snowshoes leave enormous footprints that you can't miss. Backtrack and refollow the trail to where we were earlier. Footprints just kicking in right where me and my brother were when Grandpa told us to stop for the day. After a lot of deliberation, we decide to head back, following our tracks back to the main road, where we will somehow flag down a car and get help to find our Grandpa. We hike about an hour back the way we came. Suddenly hear voice. Where the hell have you kids been? It's Grandpa and he's pissed. Says he was hiking along and all next time he turned around, we weren't there. Says our footprints just ended about 100 paces back from wherever he was when he realized we were gone. We tell him something similar happened to us, and we just got back from two miles ahead of us on the trail. Suddenly, he goes into wild animal hyper alert mode. Stops talking. Eyes scanning forest around us, head pivoting side to side, trying to see everywhere at once get freaked out and brother starts crying. Grandpa won't respond when we ask him what's wrong, quietly muttering incoherently to himself. After what seems like forever, Grandpa starts moving again. Simply says, follow me, and we do. Too scared to argue, but he's going in a third direction, i.e. not where we came from and not where we were originally headed. We are all hiking close together, literally stepping on each other's feet, can't hold hands because of ski poles, but we would have if we could have eventually emerge in a clearing. I recognize it as a lake, but you'd never know it in the winter when everything is frozen solid we get out on the ice and walk all the way to the middle of the lake before we stop. Grandpa tells us to get out our parkas, as we're going to be staying a while. Ask him what's happening. Doesn't answer. He gets out binoculars and starts to scan the shoreline. This is a pretty huge lake, so without binoculars, neither me nor my brother could really see anything besides little distant trees on the shore. At this point, Grandpa puts the binoculars down, unpacks a fairly large caliber revolver and holster, and puts it on his hip. He then picks the binoculars up and points them in the same direction he was looking a minute ago. Me and my brother both look in that direction. I can barely see something moving around. No, a couple things, all of various sizes. They're all hanging on the bank though none of them leave the thick brush surrounding the lake, or venture onto the ice. After a few minutes, Grandpa silently hands me the binoculars. When I look at the movement on the shore, I almost shit my pants. There are three animals. Two are what I can only assume are wolves. Maybe coyotes, but I don't think so, the bodies are just too long, almost snake-like. 
The third animal is some sort of all-white thing standing on two legs. The more I look at it, the stranger it seems. At first I took it to be a bear, just standing there on its hind legs. Then it starts walking, pacing around really, and the legs are just too long and slender to be a bear's. I sit down on the ice, lean up against my backpack, and get a more steady grip on the binoculars slowly realize that whatever it is has the approximate build of a human, but the head is clearly not a human head some sort of animal, I can't place. Ask grandpa what the hell I'm looking at. Brother snatches binoculars away, and when he sees it, he labels it bearman and wants to take a few shots at it. Grandpa says Indians used to dress up in animal furs in order to blend in with the animals they were hunting. Slightly stop shitting myself. It's just an Indian in a bearskin. And he has two dogs that look like wolves. And they're following us, but are afraid of ice. Start shitting my pants all over again as I realize that this is about a hundred times weirder than a real bearman. It's starting to get dark, and we're still out there on the ice. We're all watching the Indian slash bearman slash whatever the fuck it is and his dogs slash wolves slowly wandering along the coastline, clearly avoiding the ice, but clearly trying to get out onto it somehow. Every once in a while, they'll change direction, as though they were pacing back and forth. In the time I have the binoculars, I see the thing, and his dog slash wolves motionless and staring directly at us many times. No one breaks the silence for a long time. When it gets too dark to see anything on the shore, Grandpa relaxes, puts down the binoculars, and actually starts to make camp as though nothing had happened. Of course, we don't have a tent, but we do have sleeping bags and bivy bags to keep the blowing snow off of them and the wind off our faces. Me and my brother look at him like he's crazy. We're going to sleep out here. I say something like what about that guy holy shit he's right over there. Doesn't matter, we spend the long night in that exact spot. Next morning, we can't locate any animals or bear men after 45 minutes of scanning the trees around the lake. Grandpa deems it safe enough to head back by now, and since he knows these woods so well, we take a different route back to the main road than we took to get there. After one mile, he's doubling back staring at mountain tops and measuring angles between them with his arms, and I'm convinced he's lost. In the next moment, several things happen all at once. With no warning, a huge moose gallops out of seemingly thin air and almost crushes my brother, managing to push him on the ground. Grandpa collapses for an unknown reason. The three of us form a triangle and in the middle is an slender person covered in all white fur, like a polar bear, and with a bear head, or maybe a mask, but it looked pretty damn lifelike. The two wolves, I'm sure they're wolves now, are circling at a distance, or rather, one is circling, I don't see the other. Bearman lets loose a scream like you imagine Bigfoot might make when caught in a bear trap Grandpa half sits up, points revolver, and fires off three shots at the thing in rapid succession huge puff of snow like a silent explosion and can't see anything for a few seconds. Now a second moose goes hurtling through and after it's gone, and the snow has settled down the Bearman is gone too. No traces of blood to be found. Can still see the one wolf, pretty far away, but it's still circling. We proceed to book it out of the woods, taking the shortest and most direct route off the mountain. Think that grandpa isn't really sure about where he's going, but nobody gives a shit, we have to keep moving. Still think I see the wolf out at the edge of my vision, several hundred feet out through the trees, or maybe it's both of them. We eventually do get back to grandpa's car, turns out he did know where he was going. It's been covered in fresh snowfall since we left it there underscore. There's 10 inch paw prints all the fuck over it and around it. Nope nope. We clean off the snow and see that there are dents in the hood, like hail fell on it, but they're right under where the paw prints were. Nope.tar.gz.biz.nope. On the drive home, we all swear to never speak of this to grandma or to my mom. Have to swerve out of the way of a huge road kill. Almost drive off the road. Stop just in time. The thing in the road is a huge mound of fur with no distinct animal-like forms. No head, no legs, no tail. Blood everywhere. Looks like a giant skin thrown over a giant mound of flesh. It moves. No panopinopinope. Grandpa peels the fuck out drives home 30 miles per hour over the speed limit, and we never look back.
I hope that you enjoyed tonight's broadcast. If you enjoyed tonight's story, then please subscribe to the channel as more green texts will appear daily. A new broadcast will appear when the clock strikes. Midnight Central Time.